Hey everybody, welcome to PC Perspective. Building a low-cost gaming PC is basically the pinnacle of any user. And lots of uh, communities on the Reddit Build a PC subreddit, on our forums, lots of other forums out there, building that low-cost, high-performance gaming PC is really the goal of everybody out there. We started consulting some of these different outlets, these different communities, and started to see what are people actually building? What are they actually using to build these sub $600 gaming PCs that get fantastic performance out of the box uh, for the best value for that buyer? There are really two different platforms that were kind of the focus for most of the places we looked, one Intel and one AMD. The first one we looked at was the AMD Athlon X4 760K. This is actually a quad-core processor. It runs at 3.8 gigahertz. Um, it's a little bit older, but for gaming purposes, we're, looked at, we're looking at value, you know, performance per dollar. Um, the other one is the Intel Pentium G3220. Maybe some of you didn't realize the Pentium brand was still around, but it definitely is. This is a dual-core, non-hyper-threaded part that runs at about 3 gigahertz. And what we have here in front of us is a collection of parts that we use to actually buy all these system components, compare them in terms of CPU performance, GPU performance, and uh, tell you guys basically what we think is the actual best selection for all these different components. So if we look over here on the far side, you've got the AMD X4, the Athlon X4 uh, 760K processor. And along with it, we have a gigabyte F2A55M motherboard. This is, uh, it's actually labeled micro ATX, but they're actually smaller than micro ATX. These are fairly low cost motherboards, only $59 for the motherboard. The X4 processor itself is $85. So we're talking about low budget stuff here. Some of the features that you might normally expect on motherboards are also missing from that. We'll talk about in a little bit. For the Intel side, we have the Pentium G3220, as we mentioned before. Uh, it's a $65 processor, and coupling with it, we have the ASUS H81ME, also a $59 micro ATX motherboard. Those are, all, those are the only components that really differ. Obviously, we're using retail boxes, so the stock heat sinks are what we're using for, uh, for this purpose. Those aren't the best heat sinks, but again, we're trying to save money and stay on a low budget here. Common components uh, include, starting with our case back here, which is the Cooler Master N. 200. It's a micro ATX case. It's going to run you $55, $56. It actually has really good aesthetics for a $50 case. We also have a Cooler Master GX 450 watt power supply. This is uh, $50. It's not the least expensive power supply we found, but this is the one component that we highly recommend you don't skimp on. You buy a cheap power supply, if it happens to die, chances of it taking other components with it are fairly high. We have a Western Digital one terabyte hard drive. Uh, we actually have a black here in front of us, but the build that we have is actually using the Western Digital green. That's a $60 component. We have a single Corsair Vengeance DIMM, an eight gigabyte DIMM uh, that run you $73. Now we went with one DIMM instead of two, gives you more upgrade paths uh, in the future. It's less expensive than two four gigabyte DIMMs and the performance differences we actually tested were only between four and 5% on CPU based benchmarks. And then finally, probably the most important part is the uh, R9 270 graphics card. We have a Sapphire, our, our stock, our review sample of the R9 270 here. Uh, but we actually went with an MSI gaming series R9 270. That's a two gigabyte graphics card that you can buy for $180. The AMD graphics cards that used to be well overpriced, I would say over the last month or so, have come down to close to where you expect to find them, close to their MSRPs and their expected prices. At $180, the R9 270 offers fantastic performance, better than the R9, uh, R7 265, and better than the GTX 750 Ti, as we saw in our testing. So that's kind of all of the components that we would build, that you would need to build a relevant high performance, low cost gaming PC. If you don't have a copy of Windows, you'll have to purchase one of those as well. That's gonna be another hundred bucks. But for just the hardware, the Intel system comes out to $544 and the AMD system was $565, obviously at the time that we're recording this. One thing that we get knocked on a lot in our videos and articles is, the next week or two weeks later, one of these components may be $10 more expensive and a competing component may be $5 or $10 less. That's going to happen with parts in this price level. The sales and changes are, are going to vary from day to day. This is how it was today when we recorded this and when we wrote up this piece. So $544 versus $565. 
Interestingly, the Intel system is less expensive than the AMD system for us. What does that mean in terms of actual gaming performance? As it turns out, uh, the, the gaming performance of both platforms, the Intel configuration or the AMD configuration, are pretty much identical. The, in fact, the Intel systems may be one to two frames per second on average better than the AMD system, but it's really close enough that you're, it's gonna be the, it's gonna feel the same either way to the user. We were able to run um, Battlefield 4, Metro Last Light, Grid 2, several other games, all running at 1920 by 1080p at their highest image quality settings, and no problems at all. Battlefield 4 ran at 36 frames per second, Metro Last Light 37 frames per second, Grid 2 over 50 frames per second. And again, between the AMD and, and AMD and the Intel side, pretty much a wash in terms of performance there. What wasn't the same was actually CPU performance. So even though we're building this for gaming at 1080p over 30 frames per second, some of you may be curious, how do the CPUs perform? How do they differ in there? And as it turns out, it depends on the workload. The AMD processor is actually a quad-core part, so in highly threaded applications like video transcoding, handbrake, it is the better performer of the two. If you're looking at more single or dual-threaded applications, the Intel part has a better core in it, essentially, and it will actually perform better. So, you know, our Cinebench single-threaded result was 20% higher on the Intel CPU than on the AMD CPU. And most games are going to be either single or dual-threaded. That will change as we move forward, but for today, that's still kind of the case. And that kind of explains the 1% to 2% performance advantage we saw from the Intel side. Another thing to consider is in terms of feature set and connectivity. Both of these motherboards are $59. They're both kind of on lower end chipsets, but the Intel platform is actually much newer. The A55 chipset launched with AMD's Lano APUs quite a while ago. It lacks USB 3.0 and it lacks SATA 6 gigabit per second support that the Asus H81 motherboard actually does have. So for $20 less, you're getting slightly better gaming performance and you're getting better feature set in terms of having USB 3, in terms of having better support for faster hard drives and SSDs. CPU performance, it will vary depending on your workload, but I tend to lean towards the Intel platform for this case. You're gonna get the same or better gaming performance, better CPU performance in single threaded applications and workloads, better feature set. USB 3 is a feature that I think once you take advantage of it, once you use it for the first time, you know, you're using an external hard drive to back up your Steam games or something like that, uh, you're really, really, really going to love what USB 3.0 does. But if you decide to go the route of the AMD platform, maybe you do a lot of video transcoding, it's not a bad system, right? You're missing out on USB 3 and SATA, but the gaming performance, which is really the key here, is going to be the same. So. Again, $544 and $565, we've built two awesome gaming PCs for under $600, and one of them for under $550, actually. So this kind of, again, takes another step forward in proving that with, with PC gaming, you can do a lot for a not a lot of money, right? And you can, if you want 60 frames per second gaming, you can do that. We'll turn down some image quality settings, but this system will be able to handle that, and I think that's really, really impressive.